just sit here? I, I, that's what I'm, I'm like. That's mad at that soul. Should we watch? I don't Maybe I should just sit here. The whole time? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it really makes sense. Yeah. Is that all right? I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and welcome to our Joyful Noise Gospel Trio. So this is Kevin Howard, Kristen Howard, and Gregory Baird. So thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Amy Stewart Jaguer, and I am the pastor here at Pilgrim Congregational Church. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. So whoever you are, or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here among us. If you are joining us for the first time, we'd like to say an especially warm welcome to you, and we hope that you'll come back and worship with us often. I do have a few announcements for you this morning. First, uh, in your pews, you'll find this bookmark-style uh, card, 
and it says welcome at the top. So if you have something that you'd like to share with me, please fill that out and you can drop it in the offering plate on its way by this morning, a little bit later in the service. If you have a prayer request to share, whether that's a joy or a concern, you can put it on this prayer card and again, drop that in the offering plate on its way by a little bit later. There's a couple of other things I want to do. There were a lot of things that were inside your bulletin this morning, and I know at least more than one person, the contents of the bulletin spilled out on the floor. So I just wanted to make sure that you have what you need for worship today. One of the things is that there is this envelope for the Hawaiian relief donation. Our, our denomination, the United Church of Christ, is doing a special collection uh, in response to the disaster, particularly in Hawaii, as a result of the wildfires there. So if you'd like to make a donation for that purpose, you can uh, put that in this envelope, and we will make sure it gets where it needs to go. There's also an index card in your bulletin. So if you don't have one, please check now to see if you have it, because this is for the interactive part of later in our sermon. So everyone's going to need one of these cards. So if you don't have one, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring it around. So, they'll, so they're going to get them now. And you'll also need something with which to write. So you, there are some pencils in the pews, that's great. You can use one of those if you have a purse and you have a pencil or a pen in there, you can use that. And if not, Bethany has some pens and she will hand those out. So just wave down your ushers if you need an index card or if you need a pen. And if you're joining us from home, you can take a moment and go find something to write on and something to write with. That would be great. So, uh, following worship this morning, we, everyone is invited to a time of fellowship in Monblo Hall. And to get there, you go out this door and take a right, and at the end of the hallway is Monblo Hall, and we will have some cold drinks and some refreshments for you to enjoy, as well as time together in fellowship. So please join us for that. For that. And I'd like to uh, thank you, say thank you to whoever is hosting coffee hour this morning. So if you're hosting coffee hour this morning, can you just raise your hand at us? Thank you very much, you guys. We appreciate it. Uh, so now, there's also um, a couple of important announcements in another one of the inserts in your bulletin that looks like this. Next week, we will be doing Blessing of the Backpacks, which is a really fun thing to do. So uh, it's primarily focused on those returning to school, but if you're not returning to school, then you can bring your laptop or your briefcase or your lunch bag or whatever you carry with you to work or to volunteer or whatever you do. And we, whatever you bring, we'll bless it. So just bring what you have. And it's just a time for us to bless those things that help us do the things that we do as well as one another. There's also on the back side of this pink sheet, uh, our, our after school program is a wonderful thing that we offer to this community. And so there's opportunities there to support that program, either through some physical donations of items that they need, as well as um, volunteering in a variety of ways. We already have several members of the congregation who do that, and their efforts are so valued and appreciated. And if that's something that you're interested in doing in terms of lending your time and talent, uh, then you can speak to Deb and Becky, who are sitting right over here. Some of you can't see them, but they're operating our live stream. I think I've covered everything, so what I'd like us to do before we, we transition into our time of worship is to have a time of passing the peace. So we can do that with one another, but before we do that, I'd like us to include the people that are joining us via live stream. And the way we do that is, as you're able, you can please stand and turn to face the, uh, right underneath the clock, you'll see a, a video camera and you can wave to welcome those that are joining us via live stream and then please pass the peace with one another.
as you're able, will you please stand and join me in the call to worship? <clears throat> I will read the wine and you will follow with the bold print. Welcome this day to the house of our God. Welcome this day to the worship of our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Welcome this day to our community of faith. Friends, let us worship our God. Join together again in the opening prayer. <clears throat> o oh Lord, you bind us together in love to learn, to be healed, to grow, to serve. Be with us this day and open our hearts to the amazing opportunities to help others through the gifts we possess. Given by you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us read the prayer for transformation and new life. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace. Too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. Exploiting what you entrust to our care. Oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to the world's communication attitudes. Preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive, Forgive us for our conformity, conformity and transform us, O oh God.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on this earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Please pray with me. O oh, gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, what's in a name? Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet made this question a famous one. They fell in love before they knew one another's surname. So they were unaware, you remember the story, that each was a member of a rival family. Romeo is Amanteg, how do you pronounce his last name? Montague. I had a brain freeze. Montague. And Juliet is a Capulet. She cries, and you can say it with me if you remember, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore out the Romeo, deny thy faith and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes. I love that some of you remembered the words. A few lines later, Julia asks, What's in a name? And you might remember this part. That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Yes, well done. It becomes clear also as we study scripture that biblical names often hold particular significance. Sometimes, in fact, persons' names are changed after they experience a meaningful encounter with God. There are many such stories in our faith, and the stories often unfold in a familiar pattern. The character becomes aware of God's spirit being active in their life, often related to that meaningful encounter that they had, after which they experience positive transformation. Then, this transformation is often marked by a name change to symbolize the transformation they experienced. For example, our Old Testament tells the story of the promise and presence of God being so strong for Abram and Sarai that they leave everything they know behind, everything that they know and they love, to respond to God's call to undertake an unknown journey. And you probably remember this story too, that they become Sarah and Abraham, the father of our three Abrahamic faiths, whose descendants have outnumbered the stars, just as God had promised. In our New Testament, there, probably the best known example of this is Saul, who was a particularly harsh persecutor of those following Jesus. You remember this story. He experienced a powerful encounter with God walking along the road to Damascus. You remember this story? He 
now has been credited as the most influential person in the growth of early Christianity. Do you remember what his name got changed to? Paul. That's right, Paul. So what is in a name? From the example of Romeo and Juliet, their names revealed their identity to one another, but only one aspect of their identity, because at the same time their identity was already known, that is, their true human identity. As the story goes, they were more similar to one another than dissimilar, despite their long-standing family feud. From the examples of Abraham, Sarah, and Paul, recognizing their identity in relationship to God prompted a name change. So in today's story from Matthew, Jesus is asking the question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? So it prompts that same question for us. Who do we say that God is? Who do I say that God is? Who do you say that God is? If you happen to have read the weekly email that gets sent out on Fridays, you are aware that I invited you to give this question some thought over the last couple of days. And I know no one really appreciates a teacher who gives a homework assignment on a Friday. But if you already have the answer, I'm going to invite you now to please write it down on one side of your card. So just take a moment and write down, who do you say that God is? Now, I have, because I feel like I'm a pretty good teacher, I have something available for you that might help. So if you have your bulletin, you'll notice, I don't know where mine is at the moment, but on the front of the bulletin, there is a word cloud there. And the word cloud has a bunch of names that have been used to describe Jesus. So please feel free to peruse that list, which might might give you a prompt. It might help, you know, kind of spur a memory or an idea uh, that can help you get started on that idea. So like I said, there may be words there which may spark an idea with which you might find some resonance. Or perhaps you have your own preferred word or image, which is a favorite way you have come to think about or describe God. So each of you are invited to write that down on one side of your card. So you can hold on to that for now. And those of you joining at home, I hope you're participating as well. Okay, so back to today's scripture. In Jesus' question to his disciples, who do you say that I am? It is Simon Peter who is quick to name Jesus as Messiah. This is the first time in Matthew's gospel narrative that the term Messiah is used in relationship to Jesus' identity. He has been called by many other names and has used many other descriptors for himself up to this point. So why is the revelation of this moniker such a big deal? And how did Simon Peter recognize Jesus as Messiah when no one else had? Or if they had, they certainly did not dare to say it. So there are really two things happening here at once. They both have to do with the relationship between one's name and one's identity and purpose. So we'll consider Jesus' name, identity, and purpose as well as that of Simon Peter. So first... Jesus being named as Messiah marks a shift in Jesus' ministry. 
it would require many additional sermons to fully discuss the meaning of Messiah. <laughs> but for our purposes here, let's just say that it is a watershed moment that divides Jesus' Galilean ministry that we've been reading about all through this Gospel of Matthew from his passion, which now begins to unfold in Peter's recognition of him as Messiah. The second thing happening here is that Jesus recognizes that Simon Peter is blessed by God in being able to recognize this aspect of Jesus' identity. Jesus himself, here comes the name change, oh, there's something flying here, <laughs> um, to Simon Peter, from Simon Peter, as to simply Peter, Petros, which means rock, from Petra, the rock, in fact, on which the future church is built. Jesus is responding to Peter's experience of himself and his testimony which I imagine might have been worded in some what similar fashion to this. What I have experienced in you, Jesus, is that you are the Messiah, the one who has been sent to us as a gateway into the kingdom of God. We know that Peter is altogether human. You remember, he is impulsive. He's the one that stepped out of the boat and started to try to walk across the water. That, we just read about that. We also know, looking forward, that he is disloyal because he is the one, though he adamantly claims it won't happen, that he will deny Jesus not once or twice, but three times after his arrest. However, he is also faithful and open. He pays attention to the movement of God's spirit, allowing it to change him in a positive way. And so I wonder, what, by what names are you called? My given name, my formal name, is Amelia Lynn. I have been seldom called by that name, it would happen mostly at the beginning of the school year when the teachers were calling the roll for the very first time, and I had to say, I go by Amy. Not sure why my parents gave me that name, because I've been Amy all along, but occasionally my mother would use all three of my names. <laughs> Amelia Lynn Stewart. Well, I was sure that I was going to be in a lot of trouble when I heard those three names together. So when Bruce and I got married, I took his surname to represent the joining of our lives and what would become our family name as well. Bruce told me how much he loved the name Amelia. So I decided when I was changing teaching jobs and applying for new ones that I would embrace the name in my career setting. So I hadn't thought it that through that well because when I went back for a second interview at Ram High School, the, the place I would end up teaching in, the principal and the vice principal said just as soon as I walked through the door, why didn't you tell us you go by Amy? You see, they would called my references <laughs> who all knew me as Amy. Then there was nothing like the first time I heard each of my daughters call me Mommy. So I invite you to take your index card again, and this time turn it over, and on the blank side, the first thing I'd like you to do is just draw a circle in the middle of the card. Let's draw a circle in the middle of the card. And leaving the circle empty for now, I invite you to write the names which identify you around the circle. Leave the circle blank. Write the different names which identify you outside of the circle. And they're likely to be more than one, just like me. Amy, Amelia, Stuart, Jagir, Mom, Pastor, Friend. Whatever comes to your mind as words that describe you words with which you identify or identify you.
Now, in addition to all the names that I told you I'm familiar with or that I identify with, to God, I am beloved. God has redeemed and transformed my life and asks me to proclaim hope and love and joy and peace to all. So why does this part of my identity matter so much? Well, love is foundational to God's relationship with Jesus. Being God's beloved does not spare Jesus from the trials and injustices he is about to face. It does not spare us from trials and injustice either. But being grounded in his true identity strengthens Jesus to endure what is to come for him in the passion narrative. He does so in love, even as he gives new life to the world. To be truly and deeply loved is perhaps the most profound experience that any of us longs for, whether we realize it or not. Knowing we are valued and cherished can free us to pursue a purposeful life that involves loving others with the same love we have received. So I want you to know, please know, that each of you is deeply loved by God. You are created by God and profoundly gifted. The God who is love created us to live in and out of that same love. What a difference it makes to know that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God calls all of us to intimate relationship with God as loving parent who will never leave or forsake us. As with Jesus, our vocation to love and serve others flows from this reality, from this identity. It is such a powerful message in a time when many other labels other than beloved of God are used. So I invite you now in your empty circle to write these three words. Beloved of God. Beloved of God. So what's in a name? There is power. Power which can hold us back from our true identity as beloved of God. But there is also power to transform our lives in a positive way. God has called us to be service, to be the church, to help others, to offer God's message of peace and love and justice and freedom. So I hope that you'll take your card with you. There's even a a hole punched in the side, so you can hang it from your rearview mirror. You can hang it somewhere where you see it by your bathroom mirror in the morning, maybe on your kitchen table or counter or on your refrigerator, wherever you'll see it every day. Because I hope that you will continue to be aware of God's presence in your life and to add to the side of the card which describes who God is to you as you continue to discover and live into that identity that you have as beloved of God. And I hope it will remind you to embrace that very truth of your identity. May it be so.
one of the things that I really like about this part of the service is hearing from many of you folks who have spent your lifetime in this church or many, many years and listening to some of the history that you can provide, which is very uh, informational and educational and really good to hear. My years here are, are shorter than many, many of you, so I've chosen this week to, to borrow some words from other folks um, in the pleasures and the inspiration of giving. <clears throat> Generosity is giving more than you can and pride in taking less than you need. Khalil Gibran. You have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. John Bunyan. No one has ever become poor from giving. Anne Frank. You cannot do a kindness too soon because you never know how soon it will be too late. Ralph Waldo Emerson. It takes generosity to discover the whole through others. If you realize you're only a violin, you can open yourself up to the world by playing your role in the concert. Our goals are to involve the whole church in our mission to help our brothers and sisters in the community, state, nation, and the world. <clears throat> in our outreach ministry of sharing our time, talent, and treasure, to do that which Christ directed us to do. Whatever you do for one of the least of my brothers of mine, you did for me. That's the Pilgrim Church mission statement. Our offering will now be accepted. <clears throat>
Let us join together in a spirit of prayer as we dedicate these offerings received. O merciful God, you have provided each of us with many similar yet unique gifts. Thank you, O God, for the talents and abilities of people within this congregation. We are a blessed people. We have united as one body to share in this worshipful act of offering. Giving is such a joy-filled experience, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to support the transformation of people's spiritual lives through the ministry and mission of this body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So I'd like to share with you some of the prayers, or all of the prayers that have come forward for today, uh, beginning with uh, Bonnie, Ross, and their son, Alex. I'd like to lift up Shepard Hudgens Sr., who died this week in sure and certain hope of the resurrection, as well as his family. For Matt and Cammie, Amy and Bill, for Bud and Midge, for the people of Maui, and for the citizens and families and victims in Jacksonville, for Bill and Rosemary, for good health for Jesse's baby, for Kathleen and baby recently diagnosed with cardiac sickness and their medical team. For Laura, after surgery. And a couple of joys, which is also wonderful to lift up. John, scheduled to come home this week after 51 days in rehab and in the hospital in rehab. And for Eleanor, starting college. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. O oh, gracious God, we hear the wonderful words from Matthew's gospel in which Simon Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is given the name Peter, the rock upon whom the church will be built. We would like to be the kind of rock that Jesus can count on to be strong in the face of adversity, brave when danger is present, compassionate when sorrow and strife prevail. You have called us to be your church, and we ask for your transforming love that we might be better witnesses for you. Also, O oh God, we offer our prayers for the world around us, for people that we love who are dealing with sorrow and illnesses, people who feel abandoned and alone, for those who need to be set free from heavy burdens, for those who suffer and struggle in myriad ways, as well as those who courageously stand up for what they know is right, regardless of the personal consequences. We also pray, O pray, oh God, for those who oppress others, who are unable to break free from cycles of violence and anger, and those who are no longer able to empathize. We lift prayers for all of these, as well as the prayers that are in our hearts and on our minds, and we lift them now to you, O oh God, in this time of silence, for we know that sometimes the words that we have within us are too fragile for the spoken word. O 
O God of life and love, we also offer prayers for those people in situations filled with joy and with hope, a new home, the birth of a child, celebrations of special occasions, and even for this beautiful day. Hear the cries of our hearts to you, O God, and we ask that you heal and transform our lives. For we ask these and all things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
go forth in peace. Serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Comfort the afflicted. Honor one another. Love and serve Jesus Christ and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So many of you may know this last song, and we invite you to create a joyful noise with us. We repeat the first verse as the fifth verse, so please join us. Just a closer walk with thee. Yeah. 